a script. A script, if you're on the line, could you please confirm? Uh, Chair, we appear to be still missing council staff and Auscript. If it's all right with you, I'm just going to see if I can uh, find those people immediately for you. Yes, I think we need them, so we'll uh, have to find them. I, I see Councillor I'm just forward. joined, I think. I can see Lindsay there. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Afternoon. So, hello, this is Auscript. Is that working now? Oh, good. Right, OK. Yes. Oh, Perfect. Yes, Thank you. So Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Um, my name is Paul Mitchell and I'm chairing the panel this afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome you all and open the meeting formally. The other members of the panel this afternoon are Mr. Ned Wales, um, Stephen Gow and Penny Holloway. We have apologies from Stephen Phillips, who um, has declared a conflict of interest in the matter by virtue of consulting work that he's previously undertaken in the that, it, that affects the subject land. So while we have a quorum, we only we do not have a um, we do not have a full panel, but we have a quorum, as I've said. Um, I'd like to pay our respects to the uh, traditional owners of the land on which this project would occur and the meeting would normally occur. And uh, thank you all for joining remotely. Um, there are some challenges in, in doing these meetings uh, in this fashion, which I'll go through um, in a later part of the, uh, of the opening. Um, we have received declarations of interest forms for all members of the panel, and nobody has uh, declared a conflict apart from, as I say, Dr Phillips. I'd like to record that uh, in a previous working life, one member of the applicants team, Dr. Robertson, the uh, senior ecologist, is a member of that team. And Dr. Robertson worked for a company that I was uh, the managing director of for a number of years. So I'll put that on the record. That was um, more than 15 years ago, I think, um, certainly more than 10. And that relationship will not affect my views on the matter one way or the other. Um, just in terms of background for everybody's information, we have a council report that you've seen. It examines the application thoroughly. Um, it addresses the question of permissibility of the application and relevantly its recommendation is for refusal of the application. Council has received senior council's advice about the application and it says in a nutshell that the application is not permissible on the land in question. The applicant has also submitted a large volume of information as a part of its application. It also has senior council's advice and it comes to the opposite conclusion in relation to the permissibility of the application. Given that conflict, I asked the Department of Planning, um, Industry and Environment legal branch to have a look at the respective legal opinions and give me their own opinion. Um, that has been made available I apologise for this only very recently. I think it came out after two o'clock this afternoon, so I apologise for that. But in the discussions that I had with them, I thought it was important that they be on the record. So that's been, been made available to all parties, but as I say, only very late in the piece. So that's the background. Um, just to finish the process that we will follow for the meeting this afternoon is that we will firstly hear from the submitters. Each individual has three minutes to address us. If you're representing a community a group, you would have 10 minutes. The applicant has a total of about 20 minutes or thereabouts and council the same. Um, following that, in fact, that's not correct. Those two time periods are 45 minutes each for the applicant and the council. So I withdraw those earlier comments, they're 45 minutes each. During those times, the panel will ask the applicant and the council various questions. Following those presentations, the panel will adjourn to 
determine its decision, then we will reconvene and give you our, um, our decision on the application. And then finally, just in terms of, of, um, of making these meetings as workable as possible, can you all please um, make sure that one person speaks at one time? It becomes very disruptive if people are trying to intervene. So if we do everybody the courtesy of, of holding your fire until whoever is speaking has stopped speaking. And um, as you would have noticed, leaving and joining the meeting is also very disruptive. So please minimise the amount of times that you do that and please resist doing it during the middle of one of the presentations because it means we can't hear what's being said. So that is the process. That's the... There we go. We have a very good illustration in fact. Um, and that wasn't scripted. Okay, um, that's the background. That's the process we'll be following. So we firstly hear from um, the, the speakers, the registered speakers, and I have a list here. And um, Ms. Nezel, are you there, please? You're speaking on behalf of Northern Rivers Guardian, I understand. Northern Rivers Guardians. Ah, uh, yes, I'm here. You're here. Will you have uh, 10 minutes with a little bit of license? So please be conscious of that. Paul, could I, so sorry, Chair, could I just confirm the arrangements? Did you still want council to address first and the public submissions to take start from 4.30 p.m.? Uh, whichever you think's better, Lisa. We, you, you think we should have council first. I was I, going to say council could respond to the submitters, the submitters' concerns if they're all here. Yes, so I believe that the agenda that we've advertised uh, is the, the going first, and then the applicant, and then the submitters from four thirty, and then the applicant will have fifteen minutes to respond to new issues raised, and council will have fifteen minutes at the very end to respond okay. to all issues okay. raised by okay. all parties. No, right, okay, that's appropriate. Ms. Nessa, we'll put you on hold if that's all right, and we'll go in the order that's on the published agenda. So we'll hear from council first, then. Um, and who is addressing us from council, please? That's uh, Lindsay McGavin. Okay, off you go, Mr. Gavin. Thank you. Uh, council has received a concept stage development location for a rural land sharing community and associated works over 21 lots, which are to be subdivided into 11 lots. Importantly, the application does not propose the construction of dwellings. Stage one of the concept application involves relatively minor works relating to private internal road works located at access point two. All works are located within private property and do not undertake works within the Cuyahoga Road Reserve. The site has an area of 1,584 hectares consisting of mainly land zone RU2 rural landscape with an area zone RU5 village and minor and a minor area zone W1 natural waterways under the Tweed Local Environmental Plan 2014. The application seeks approval of 392 dwelling plots over 10 lots to create 10 interconnected rural land sharing communities. The remaining lot will contain all of the RU5 village zoned land. The application was lodged with, with a claimed capital investment value of $37 million, which exceeds the $30 million threshold for determination by the panel. Um, in accordance with uh, Schedule 7 of the Regional De Significant Development State and, State and Regional Development SEP. Council sought a legal opinion provided in the, which has been provided to the panel from a senior council on two matters relating to the development application. In summary, the advice has concluded that costs associated with site, sewer, rainwater tanks and solar systems should be excluded from the calculation of the CIV for the proposed development. Therefore, a CIV of $21 million plus 15% contingencies. And it, the proposed development is prohibited on a number of grounds. Um, the applicant was advised of council's position and requested to withdraw the application. The application has not been withdrawn. Um, the Northern Regional Panel and the, the department were advised of council's position. On the 16th of June, 2021, a revised COV estimate was submitted. The, the revised COV is $39,850,000, um, therefore still exceeding the $30, $30 million threshold. Items that were previously contended by council, such as water tanks, septic tanks, and solar systems have been removed. Costings for roadworks have been revised and bridges have now been included. 
Whilst there is limited detail on items such as bridges in the development application, the revised CIV is taken on face value and rather prolonged conjecture about the CIV, it is recommended to continue with the application on the pathway of regional development. The development application is referred externally to Natural Resources Ac Access Regulator, Heritage Community Engagement, Department of Premier and Cabinet, New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, Biodiversity and Conservation Division. All of the agencies either required further information or did not support the proposal. The Biodiversity and Conservation Division advised that they estimate the proposed development would, would require extensive land clearing of approximately 106 hectares of native vegetation with a further 220 hectares of impact in native population areas described as cleared grass paddocks with scattered trees, regrowth and weed thickets. The cost of biodiversity offsets required to offset the loss of biodiversity values to enable the proposed development is estimated in excess of $27 million. Uh, the assessment report has revealed that the application should be refused for the following reasons. The proposal is not consistent with Schedule 5 of the Primary Production and Rural Development SEP, as the development is not development on a single lot for three or more dwellings. Contrary to clause 41a of schedule 5 and therefore prohibited the proposal is not consistent with schedule 5 of the prime production rural development set as the development is on on each lots relies on development on other lots contrary to clause 41a of schedule 5 and is therefore prohibited the proposal is not consistent with the aims in clause 2a and c of schedule 5 of the primary production and rural development set as the development a proposes to undertake subdivision to create lots for interconnected rural land sharing and is therefore prohibited under clause 41G of schedule five. B creates unacceptable undue harm to the environment and is therefore prohibited under clause 41G of schedule five. Four, the proposal is not consistent with schedule five of the prime production rural development set as the development is in breach of the cap on population density in clause seven of schedule five to the set. Five, the proposal is not consistent with Schedule 5 of the SEP as the development is on land that is a wildlife corridor contrary to Clause 41D of Schedule 5 to the SEP and is therefore prohibited. Six, the proposal is not consistent with Schedule 5 of the SEP as an Abri Aboriginal cultural heritage assessment on the, of the surrounding land has not been undertaken and therefore consent cannot be granted because Council is unable to take into account the heritage characteristics of the land and surrounding land as required by Clause 5C of Schedule 5 of the SEP. The proposal is considered to create significant environmental impacts on both the natural and built environments due to significant amount of native vegetation removal and impact on native fauna. Eight, the site is considered not to be suitable for the proposal due to the existing constraints. Nine, the proposal is considered not to be in the public interest due to the high impact of the environment on the environment and cultural heritage, the iso isolated location, and the absence of a coherent management strategy for capital and recurrent funding of the proposed infrastructure and environmental management. 10, insufficient information has been submitted with the development application to enable an assessment of the impacts of the proposal. Thanks, Mr. Gavin. That's been, uh, that's very helpful. Um, is that all you wanted to say in opening? Uh, yeah, surely. Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, panel members, questions of Mr. McGavin or other council officers who are with him? Um, I'll go first there, if that's all right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Now. Um, uh, Mr. McGammon, thank you for your um, comments and your report. Um, I just have one question at this point, um, and it goes to uh, one of the specific aims uh, in Schedule 5 of the relevant SEP. Um, uh, I noticed in the report reasons you've commented on a couple of these aims, but the one I'm interested in is the final one, which says that these uh, <coughs> these sort of developments are to create opportunities for an increase in rural population in areas that are experiencing population loss. Um, have you received any evidence uh, to um, address that particular aim? And have you any other comments to make in the context of this particular location and site? Thanks, panel member. Um there hasn't been any evidence supplied to suggest that the area is experiencing population loss. Um, there hasn't, um, likewise, Council hasn't interrogated ABS statistics to determine that in this particular area. Um, I think 
uh, probably anecdotally, there's um, migration towards rural areas um, on the north coast, uh, but certainly there's no there's no statistical information to suggest otherwise of that. Um, the other point there to make is the SEP also has to counterbalance um, um, incoming population with the capacity of the land, and hence that's why there's population caps built into the SEP as well. So that creates that balance between increasing uh, population in, in, in areas um, and putting a, a, a cap um, to match the capabilities and the suitabilities of the site and the area. That's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Paul, you're, you're on mute, Paul, sorry. Any further questions? Not from me, thank you. Okay, who'd like to go next? I have one, but I think Ned had, had his hand up first. Mr. Okay, Wales I'll had his hand up this. first. Thank you. Ned, you're on mute. Sorry, Mr. Wiles, I, I, um, I can't hear you. I'm desperately trying to read, understand what you're saying, but I can't hear you. Maybe Chair, while um, Mr. Wiles is trying to sort out the um, thing, I could ask my question. Um, and Ned, you, I think you'll have to phone in or something because we can't hear you. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask um, a question further to what, um, Mr. Gowers said, which is uh, Tweed Shire Council has a rural villages strategy. Is that not correct? Yes, it does. Yeah. So how how does this um, how does this application fit into the vision and desires and objectives of the rural villages strategy in terms of development of villages in the hinterland? Yeah, well, it, it wouldn't fall into the rural villages strategy because the villages are existing. So the strategy relates to the existing villages throughout the Shire. Um, and this is effectively creating, um, in, in a sense, a new village on rural land. Um, so uh, the villages strategy is designed to um, uh, have a, a forward thinking uh, strategic document for the existing villages throughout the Shire as opposed to a, a large rural land sharing uh, development um, outside the scope of that um, that actual strategy and the villages themselves. Right, so um, the, the nearest village to this proposed development is um, Kung, Kunga or Kungra? I don't know how you pronounce it. Kunga, yeah. Kunga. Um, does that form part of the, is that covered in the, the rural villages strategy? Are, they, are, they, are there proposals for development of that village in the strategy? No, nothing substantial. The most, the closest substantial village, um, which is actually his own rural village is Yukai. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, no, thanks that, for that clarification. Thank you. Okay. Well, how are you going? Can you have a sort of your audio? No. Um, as Penny suggested, probably best to call in. Stay on the screen, but call in if you can. And while you're doing that, I'll just ask Mr. McGovern a couple of questions, if I could. Mr. McGovern, thanks for your presentation. Can you just you say that it seems to me there's a little bit of an inconsistency between reason six and nine in that in six you say there's no AHIP that's been concluded or completed and so therefore it's not possible to come to a definitive conclusion in relation to cultural heritage but then in nine you say that there will be a high impact on cultural heritage. How did you come to the conclusion is there not an inconsistency there between the two? Sure. Um, at, at six, it's specifically referring to what the SEP requires, which is a assessment yeah. on 
lands outside of the actual site, so the surrounding land. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And this area is um, is well known as having high cultural heritage values, um, and and nine is related to the actual site where we've had. Um, there's a report talks about a strong submission from the Tree Byron Aboriginal Land Council to say that this site, the actual site, has significant. Um, uh, uh, attributes for cultural heritage and council's mapping mm -hmm. actually reflects that as well. So that's where the two mm -hmm. things are. Um, on six, we're saying they haven't done the assessment or off the site or the surrounding area. And nine, the information mm -hmm. provided hasn't provided enough information for the actual site. Okay, yes, I get the distinction. Thanks for that. Um, in the report in relation to SIP 55, in the council's report, your report, you say that the information that's been presented is incomplete. I mean, do you really think that contamination is going to be an issue on a site like this, that's in a largely undeveloped area, and arguably there is not a significant change of use? Um, I'd, no, I wouldn't agree with that. The rural areas actually no? um, can be significantly affected by contamination. Um, it needs a, a deep dive into historical uses. Um, I'm not saying that this site has, but things like banana farming had a lot of chemicals used on them throughout the Tweed. Mm. I'm not saying that this site had banana farming, but um, and up, uh, it's storage around storage sheds, and the report actually picks up on some of those things. Um, it does tend to sort of say that they'll deal, um, go deeper with those sorts of investigations further down. In, in later stages, I think we're simply saying that well, we we need to know more about that up front. Um, um, yeah, it's a large site, but I don't think it, you could sort of make the mistake to say that it's you know it's rural land that may or may not um, have contamination to it. It needs to be investigated a lot more thoroughly than uh, simply you know, having a, a pass over it, saying there's a few rural sheds which may or may not have been used. So. They've done some work in that area, but also the SCE states that they'll um, they'll they'll kick that issue down the down the road a little bit further. We're saying that we'll, we need to know more about that up front. And the application, this is correct. If it's not, please tell us. Does identify specific uh, lots or locations for housing plots? Is that correct? Doesn't identify the, lots. The no, yeah. no, sorry, the future sites or locations Plots, of the yeah. housing yeah, is identified. So it would be reasonable to understand whether that land, which will be you know, subject to residential use, is, is contaminated or not. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, if, uh, Nick, sorry, there's some feedback there, but the, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the plans indicate the you know, the, the general location of where the plots were. So, you know, obviously they're large areas, but still they, they can be identified in that um, generally where for contamination purposes, the exercise wouldn't be that difficult to do in terms of identifying where future residential houses are going, or future dwellings would be going. Um, so, um, but it you know, may not necessarily should be restricted to just the house sites area because the development application proposes community buildings and. Um, an amphitheater and things like that as well so it would need to go beyond just the actual individual house sites as well okay thank you uh, just two further questions if i could um water quality there is a uh, a comment i think under the heading of stormwater control where the conclusion is that water quality would not be a problem and yet later in respect to um drinking water i think it is that th there is a potential problem with water quality raised. What is the uh, justification if there is one for the inconsistency there? Well, I think they're, they're, they're two different things. Like stormwater relates to um, uh, runoff, stormwater, stormwater runoff, which can be treated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if it, it on, on this scale of this site, then the runoff from houses and roads and things like that could be um, treated reasonably well because there's areas for if there needed to be a treatment pond or retention and filters and things like that those sort of things could be designed into it the, the water catchment um, 
uh, overlay provision is something quite different to that. N not necessarily totally unrelated, but um, drinking water catchment um, needs a lot more, it has a lot more integrate ingredients that go into the assessment of it um, in, in terms of septic tanks, um, uh, other land uses that could take place on the on the site that may not be pro appropriate for being in a drinking water catchment. So there, there's somewhat two different things. One is the treatment of, in the ordinary sense of just storm water, rainwater falling on houses and roofs and in, on roads and mm -hmm. things like that. And then the whole catchment in terms of um, water running off that site for um, in, into uh, potential drinking, the drinking water catchment of the Tweed River. Righto, okay, thank you. So you've explained that, uh, that they're not the same water quality in the same sense there's a different purpose um, yeah. look finally in relation to services the adequacy of services questioned on page 29 i think it is of your report but earlier on page 26 it is said that all essential services will be provided within the development or by the development again is that not an inconsistency if it's not please explain your rationale i'll just find what that 20 is yeah, page, page 29, 20, 29. Page, you say that there is a question about the adequacy of services to service the future population. But on page 26, it said that all essential services will be provided by the development. Why that seems to be not consistent. Sorry, Paul, I'll just, what heading is it under? Ma maybe, we, jump uh, in maybe to assist, it's Steve Gow here. Um, when you're referring to page 26, are you talking about the uh, heading in the middle of the page, clause 7.10, essential services? Uh, I'll just have to find it. That's probably right. It says there, all essential services yeah, are yeah, made yeah. of the yeah, site. Clause 7.10, that's right. Yes, I wondered about that as well. And then page yeah. 29. Despite being isolated from uh, services, uh, the, sec the first full paragraph. Okay, what's, okay, we've got 17. What, what was the other comparison? Yeah. Page 29. So we don't have a numbered paragraph. page one, sorry. So what's the right heading that's under? That's a good question. It's above. Uh, schedule three or point three schedule to which land applies. It's um, under the heading of aims of the schedule. Last point. The discussion of that. And you'll see significant fall loss. The site being isolated from services is the. Uh, is oh, the okay. I, I think just to try um, 710, it refers to yeah. uh, more like the infrastructure that. Um, like telecommunications and electricity, those types of things. So um, the yep. comment at 710 simply reflects that the developer would be providing those things um, as, in the course of a normal development, so to speak. And and the other the other comment about services is the more general services that are provided by a community or a town or a village and those types of things. Um, you know, schools, emergency services. Um, right. hospital, okay. those types of things. So we're saying that it's isolated from those things. 710 is referring to the more the hard infrastructure provision on the actual site. Okay, right. I was going to ask you to give me examples, but you've done that. Thank you very much. That's all I had. Can uh, I Mr. Wiles, can ask a follow-up there, Paul? Yeah, of course you can. Yes, off, off you go. So, sorry, just while we're on that subject, Paul, sorry to interrupt. Um, just in relation to um, 710, um, the applicant's statement of environmental effects talks about um, drinking water being supplied to residents from rainwater tanks. Um, now that that may well be possible in a, a conventional, uh, I think 40 hectares is the minimum lot size normally for this zone. Um, so that might well be permissible uh, there, but in a, in a development uh, of this uh, magnitude, 392 dwellings, um, how would council feel about that number of dwellings all being reliant on on rainwater, individual rainwater tanks, or even collective rainwater tanks? Um, it, it, if if they were, I guess it depends how they ultimately did it. If it's a, a rainwater tank for each house, um, then 
it may be more manageable in terms of um, things like cross-contamination and health and things like that. If there was a combined tank that, say, serviced um, a cluster of houses or a number of them, um, and how that water was distributed and, and you know, the, the tanks were maintained and things like that, it certainly raises some questions of how that would be managed. May not be impossible to do that, but it certainly raises the, the stakes in terms of uh, the health of the users of the water and, um, you know, does it give rise to disputes and things like that about who maintains and is someone using too much water and um, and those types of things. So, um, there, there, there's a management issue on that sort of scale if they were collectively using um, water tanks and things like that. Thank you. I appreciate the applicant's view is probably going to be that that will be subject to um, that matter will be subject to being fleshed out in more detail in future DAs, of course. But I just thought I'd ask that question um, in response yeah, to what question. Paul's. It's a good question. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Ned Wales, how are you going? Are you portable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Ned has said yeah. that he's continuing to have audio problems. I've been in touch with him on email. We haven't been able to sort those out. However, the question that he had his hand raised to ask earlier was the one that Penny uh, asked as well. So he's quite happy with the responses he's received from Council. And no further questions. Is that correct? Yep. All right. Thanks very much, Mr. McGavin. We'll, we'll get you back. Um, if you could just be prepared to respond or we may ask you to respond to um, any issues raised by some of the submitters after no we've heard from the applicant. Okay, sure. good. Thanks very much, Mr. Kevin. Thank you. That was very helpful. So we now go on to the applicant and Mr. Goff, you're leading the charge, I understand. Oh, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, so so you've got You've got three quarters of an hour. Uh, again, we'd like to ask you questions, so if you could please be mindful of that. But the time is yours. Yes, thank you. How I'd like to structure with structure our um, our presentation with your leave. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, this development application um, has not um, been kind to the applicant in that the fact that um, there was no allegation. Sorry, there was no uh, letters written to council to the applicant. Sorry. Um, requesting further information. So we're at the stage where we're seeking the determination of this application. However, we haven't been able to fully respond to such allegations of insufficient information that were contained in the officer's report. Um, and it's it's disappointing to know that, for example, the Robertson legal advice of April 2021 was not provided until a number of weeks ago. And that, that had a number of allegations of insufficient information that if we were provided adequate time, we certainly could have provided um, the information or, or an adequate re response. But so how we like to structure this uh, response uh, is uh, for myself to give an overview of, uh, of the legal position, um, our town planner to give an overview of the development, um, the design philosophy and to respond to town planning considerations. Um, there are then six other experts that we wish to bring forward only for, for short presentations to address some of the allegations of insufficient information because my final submission will be that there is adequate information um, before the panel that would allow it to uh, issue an approval for this application. Um, so the application before the panel is for two aspects. The first aspect as Council has identified is for a concept development application which will accommodate future development, including the subdivision of land, the construction of roads, the construction of community facilities, um, and 10 rural land share communities. And it's the applicant's position that all those uh, uses and development are permissible on this land. The second element that we are seeking approval for is the construction work associated with stage one, um, and that includes the upgrading and sealing of a 75 metre section of an existing driveway from Kyogle Road, which will involve a small amount of cut and fill, less than 100 mils, removal of smaller vegetation, uh, not trees, however, the construction of a stormwater culvert and the placement of a temporary site office. 
Um, so council have assessed this application and then provided a recommendation of refusal on, on 10 specific grounds, which in my view can be categorised into two broad categories. The first is that the panel is not empowered to approve this application as it seeks consent for prohibited development. And secondly, that the application doesn't contain sufficient information. With respect to permissibility, I, I wish to address the panel briefly uh, in due course. However, turning now to the level of information that we've contained within the application, I wish to point out the, the following observations. Um, this is a concept development application made under Division 4.4 of the Act. And as the panel is aware, the Act was uh, somewhat recently amended to allow an applicant to lodge an application that is in a concept form. Um, as the panel is aware with the decision of Bay Simmers, uh, with the old stage development application, you couldn't just lodge a concept. The Court of Appeal said it had to have um, more information than a concept. However, the Act was specifically amended to allow a concept to be put before a, a consent authority. And what the other recent amendment did is it, it allowed the consent authority or excused the consent authority from considering the likely impacts in the carrying out of development that may be the subject of subsequent development applications. And if I could just read out the second reading speech with that amendment, because in my view, it, it really sets the stage of what this application is trying to do. So, I, and I quote, the purpose of this bill is to restore the procedures for stage development applications and how first stage concept proposals are assessed. Stage development applications are often lodged for complex residential, commercial, retail and hotel developments to obtain in principle approval which set out key planning parameters like use, shape and scale up front, allowing the finer grain details and operational impacts of a proposal to be spelled out in future applications when those more detailed aspects are fully developed. Importantly, a first stage concept approval does not allow any works on a site to start. This ensures that all relevant impacts are fully assessed in subsequent stage development applications before any work may be carried out. It's secondly relevant to observe the effect of Regulation 70 capital A of the regulations and what that provision allows, um, sorry, what that provision um, allows is that any of the mandatory documents required to be lodged with a, a DA may be deferred and lodged with subsequent development applications come up with the approval of the consent authority. So matters such as BDARs or, or any of the mandatory considerations or, or mandatory documents in the Act or the regulations for a stage or concept development application, they can be deferred to later. Um, so in regard to the insufficient information, I, I just asked the panel to understand the, 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 how we've got to this position. Firstly, we lodged our application. We have not received any response back from council saying uh, the information is deficient. Um, we've proceeded on the basis that this is a concept development application. We've proceeded on the basis that further finer grain details will be provided down the track. Um, and in my submission, the information that is before the panel is sufficient for an informed assessment to be made. Um, with your leave, um, I would now ask uh, Mr. Daniel Mur Heron, our uh, the applicant's town planner, to give an overview of the project. Well, you, by all means, we'll do that. But perhaps if we, if you just pause there, because you've raised a number of very important issues, sure. um, I'll ask council when we get back to council as to why they haven't asked for further information. Um, that's an important point, but. Why do you say that the issues that, that you've raised can be deferred to uh, the subsequent stage of detailed DAs? Is it not the case though that we have, have to at least have uh, better than in principle understanding of how key issues would be addressed? In other words, I presume you're not, a, not suggesting that, you know, the fundamental considerations we don't have to look to at all. We no, don't need not to be we'd need to be satisfied, would we not? And, and if it is not, please explain why, that, you know, issues can be addressed that are that are relevant to the application. Yes. And I'd raise things like flood evacuation, bushfire, ecology, 
offsets, how all of those things would be would be met, we'd need to have at least a practical understanding of what was proposed and um, yeah. sufficient information to show that those things right. could be practically uh, addressed. It, it, would you agree with that or not? I absolutely agree with that, uh, Mr Chairperson. Um, and, and indeed, you are to assess the concept itself. So there is a concept yeah. before the panel that would need determination and there are mandatory considerations that you need to be satisfied mm -hmm. of. So, um, and I'm not saying that you're not have to have regard to any of the assessment and it's all down the track, of course, that, that would be flying in the face of Division 4.4. .4. What I'm saying is the finer grain details like the size of rainwater tanks, um, things that, that are that intricate or the, the, the location and design of buildings, they are matters that are clearly uh, relevant to the future application which will seek um, the exact location of these buildings and the, the construction of these buildings. That is when that detail should be provided. Right, well, let me give you one example, one question that's fundamental. The Rural Fire Service has declined to give its, uh, its, uh, its, con its approval for the yes. concept plan. Um, you know, life and property is a fundamentally important issue. Yes. How are we how are we assured that that uh, key issue would be addressed? Could be well, effectively I, I, addressed. In a perfect world, we would have got those comments and been able to respond to them. But we do have our fire, um, uh, sorry, our, our fire engineer uh, who will address the panel, and they are going to address, and he is going to address all the matters raised by the RFS. And in my submission, you would be satisfied that the concept development application will provide adequate fire egress and access um, and all the buildings will be protected with appropriate APZs. Okay, well, we'll wait for that when it happens. Thanks, Mr Goff. Do any other members of the panel have questions of Mr Goff at this stage? Um, I do about the overall concept, but maybe I'll hear from the planner first because that might cover okay. some of the issues that I want to talk about. Okay, thank you. Any, Steve Gow or Ned Wales, any questions of Mr? No, 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 no. right. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Goff. Okay, so we're, we now hear for, from Mr. Blanford or Mr. Mulhern, right, is that right? Mul Mulhern, if I could ask him to unmute okay. and put his camera on. You got me there, Yes. So thank you, Andrew, for that, and thank you, panel, council, and community uh, for having us here today. We've been asked to speak to the overall planning methodology and the strategic thinking behind the subject concept TA, and particularly having regard to the concerns being raised in council's assessment report regarding suitability under the legislative planning framework. But first, we wanted to see, uh, we wanted to inform the panel and the community, as well as council, on what is NICAP and why this site has been pursued for this expansive development outcome. NICAP is the land of South for multiple rural land sharing communities, delivered through the amalgamation of 21 privately owned and fragmented rural parcels of land into 10 allotments, <clears throat> each comprising a community of up to 62 individual homes which flank, support and contribute to the rural village of Kunga. The NICAP proposal is being driven by a conglomerate of life and like-minded individuals seeking to establish intentional communities within the rural landscape through collective ownership. Community members have contributed and continue to guide the concept plan and the vision for NICAP. This is done through regular community updates, inquiries and feedback. This collection of families and individuals have chosen a housing and lifestyle outcome that affords independence and home ownership while sharing the land as well as the resources and the skills of their community. A collection of ecological, cooperative, organic and social rural land sharing communities. <clears throat> Exploring and acknowledging the key, the key planning influences, specifically the biophysical attributes, the socioeconomic drivers and the established planning framework, our project team has investigated the suitability of this site to be pursued for such an expansive undertaking. Firstly, social and economic analysis confirmed that the availability of health, community and social services for a growing population, yet specifically noted a declining and ageing population in the immediate and surrounding area. This actually risks the operation of the existing services that they increasingly become obsolete in the absence of a population increase. So that same analysis expressed a continued shortfall in housing delivery throughout the tweet for over a 10 year time frame. 
This is fostering a very real and urgent need for alternative housing prospects in the local government area. To balance the opportunities and constraints of the site, we undertook detailed site investigations before graphically representing these through constraints and analysis, uh, constraints and opportunity mapping. This process sought at a high level to correlate the vision and the land use outcome being sought by NICAP with practical site and development outcomes to underpin the NICAP key structure. Specifically, this involved avoiding areas of constraint. So indicating sloped, inaccessible areas and even identifying areas of the highest ecological value to be avoided. Ground truthing of former corridors and establishing new corridors in locations to mitigate any risk to fauna survival in the area. And identifying the areas where development can be pursued. This was based on the landform, existing plantation areas which are abundant across the site, access to and across the site, while allowing for the future homes, the essential services, community facilities and bushfire hazard management within identified developable areas. Stepping forward from that constraints and opportunities mapping, the concept plan for NICAP was developed. The layers of NICAP, which layered NICAP's underlying opportunities with its anticipated integration of services and land uses. In light of the size of this proposal and the importance of balancing the environmental, socio, social and economic interests, the delivery of a concept plan or more broadly NICAP is being pursued through a concept development application process. This confirms NICAP as the highest and best use of the land and provides coordination and clear direction to the future development applications that will actually deliver it. A strategic land use process such as rezoning was not pursued given the permissibility it was already afforded through the primary production set. Individual development applications were not pursued because the, de the benefits of a concept proposal was in the ability to set that framework and allow fine grained detail to follow. The council assessment report has concluded an inconsistency with the primary production set, primarily on the questions of permissibility, which has been discussed briefly and will be continue to be discussed with Andrew, and insufficient detail and a perception of environmental impact. Andrew, Andrew Goff and Senior Council have comprehensively addressed the permissibility questions, though those will continue to be worked through today. And beyond the questions of permissibility, Council's assessment report, and more specifically the reasons for refusal, can include an inconsistency with the aims and provisions of the state policy and the Act based on environmental impacts and the level of information provided. As alluded by Andrew, our project team is available today to discuss their specific detail of their specialist reports that formed part of the, develop the concept development application. This has guided the concept plan and quantified the significant positives of this proposal against the enabling primary production state policy, as well as state and local strategic and statutory planning requirements. So each of those 10 refusal points will be spoken to today by our consultant team, and specifically in terms of point nine of the assessment report, we wanted to talk to that. So point nine raised, raised public interest as a concern and related this to the environmental impacts, cultural heritage, isolation, which Mark Courtney and Mark Rickman will speak to, as well as the management and funding of these communities moving forward. Broadly speaking to NICAP, it has several revenue streams available for that ongoing management. Primarily this will be done through the initial investment of a community as they come into the community network, plantation profits across the site with 500 hectares of previously and currently um, utilised plantation areas, and the ongoing community funding payments as well as revenue created through the village upon its establishment. So that ensures that there is an ability for these communities to be maintained and protected moving forward, and that this will not have a detrimental impact on the public services of the interest of the area. So that's in summary what we wanted to talk to from a planning point of view, but happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Mr. Mulhern, that's good. Um, I'll just ask you a couple of questions if I could, and then we'll go to other panel members. What do you say about the density provisions of the rural land sharing SEP and um, whether or not you've satisfied those? So in terms of the density provisions, they do apply to the lot that the rural land sharing community is established on. The site is currently 21 lots. It was originally investigated to lodge individual rural land share communities for each of those individual lots that each complied with the density provisions in and of their own right. So under a concept by creating 
multiple lots and then applying individual rural land sharing communities to each of those, they are able to achieve the density provisions under that state policy for each lot. Well, well is that so? I'm, you know, if you're it's th plus 300, uh, three, nearly 400 dwellings that you're proposing, that's well in exceedance of the uh, the likely density, is it not? Or the, the permitted density for the uh, for the individual lots, the ultimate individual lots. So the individual lots, if they're 270 hectares, for example, are permitted to have 80 dwellings under the rural ledge, uh, under the primary production state policy. We don't have lots that have more dwellings allocated to them than the land area for that specific lot. Lots created through the subdivision that will happen before the DAs for those individual rural land share communities. We don't have density behind them that is allowable under the state policy. Okay, so, right, I will. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no, effectively, that was one of the first questions we had to review through that legal advice from this story and not. So, Andrew's probably better place to answer that question in terms of the permissibility and density point of view. But we did actually test and provided that legal advice to council back in 2018 in terms of multiple rural land share communities not being determined to be a single lot. Okay, well, look, we'll. Mr. Goff, if you can if you can put that on because I know a number of the panel members are interested in that question and maybe council should also give us their view on that. Can I just ask you also about the, the question of uh, there being a wildlife corridor, an identified wildlife corridor on this this uh, property and how the provisions, the relevant provisions of the SEP are met in that respect? Yes, yeah, so Sorry, Andrew. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I was intending to deal with that with my uh, impermissibility. So, um, if I if I could defer that to slightly later in our presentation, the wildlife corridor. Okay. Yes. Okay, that's yes. fine. Just two other questions, if I could. You talked, um, Mr. Mulhern, about the um, the financial arrangements that are available. Where are they explained in the application? What are we approving? So in terms of the financial arrangements, it's probably a question for uh, our economic analysis specialist as well as the client. But ultimately, the concept sets up multiple communities. Each of those communities are owned by the residents of that community. So there's an ability there through stewardship to create income and credits for the offset of biodiversity offsets. There's also an ability for each of those communities to generate income through payments within that community to fund the management. The management framework and structure has been worked through with the applicant as well as their legal team, and that would guide the management of each of those communities. And where is that explained in the application? Those arrangements explained in the application. In the application, Maybe we provided the draft community management statement. We also provided uh, Effectively, the rehabilitation management strategies in their conceptual, in their conceptual design. So, in terms of what you're asking us to approve in that respect, it's in the draft community management statement. Yeah. So we're not asking for approval of the draft community management statement. We're asking for approval for the concept for the ten rural land sharing communities to be able to set under the framework of the young studies to come in with the detailed DA. So we haven't got the defined framework that was provided in draft to allow us this opportunity to work through with council and the panel as to how that is developed. Unfortunately, we haven't had that opportunity to date, but happy to work on that further. Okay, um, final question is this, uh, subdivision is prohibited under the SEP, correct? Beyond, Sub the, beyond the eleven lot, beyond the eleven lots. So subdivision prohibited. Yeah. So the, the within the lot with the, within each rural land sharing lot, subdivision is prohibited. Yes. So with beyond the eleven lots. Yes. Um, are you not proposing community title for the uh, each of the eleven lots, and is that not subdivision? 
No, it won't be registered community tiles for each of those lots. There'll be a management structure that, uh, and a business structure that entitles each of the landholders to their rights and responsibilities, but it's not subdivision by definition. We're not subdividing the land. You don't have land ownership of separate parcels within those master lots. Okay, well, Mr. Goff, you might want to be aware of that question because I know, again, that other members of the panel uh, ha, uh, have seen suggestions or statements within the material that's been provided that that is a part of the proposal. A community so, title um, subdivision. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Of 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 the future rural land sharing lots. So of one of the ten lots. But Mr. Gow, maybe maybe Steve, you want to go on to that question if that's appropriate. I don't have anything further for Mr. Mulvaney. Uh, yes. Well, okay, I'll just, just make a comment uh, rather in response to that rather than a question, but I just refer to the neighbourhood management statement lodged with the statement of environmental effects. I, I'm, I hear what uh, Daniel Mulher Mulheran's just said, but um, that, that document is uh, headed neighbourhood management statement and underneath that it's got Community Land Development Act 1989 Community Land Management Act 1989, Community Management Statement and Neighbourhood Association Deposited Plan Number and the document, my reading of it, um, referred to neighbourhood lots and the subdivision of land by a neighbourhood plan. So that's where um, that's where that's come from, just, just to put you on notice about that. That was going to be one of my questions. Um, so if I could just go back to Mr Mulherron in terms of questions on what he had to say. Um, I take it you, you do accept, from, from what I've read of the statement of environmental effects, you do accept that Schedule 5 of the SEP applies to this development application, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, just in relation to that then, I'll just ask you the same question that I asked the Council. Um, what do you say in relation to, we have to be satisfied if, if that is the case, that the development is consistent with the aims of Schedule 5. One of those aims is that the development should create opportunities for an increase in rural population in areas that are experiencing population loss. What evidence have you brought forward in the application to demonstrate that the area is experiencing population loss? Because I couldn't find any evidence of that. Yep. So we, we do have Mark Courtney from Macro Plan who can talk to the economic needs assessment that was done. Ultimately the findings in the, in the SEE and the economic needs did show that there was an ageing population and then a decrease in overall population in the local areas. So in the SEE um, it'll be in section three. Uh, there was talk of a, a, it's it wasn't a significant drop in the population around that area, but it was noted that with an ageing population and a decrease in the younger demographic, there was a risk to services in the local uh, villages. So I'll let Mark Courtney from Macro Plan expand on that when he talks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll look for that with him. Thank you. You're, you're on nothing, still on mute, Paul, nothing, sorry. Nothing further on uh, that, Steve? From, no, from that's, Mulherin. well, I just, I'll, I'll await for that advice when it's forthcoming. That'd be, that'd be interesting. Thank you. Oh, I've nothing right, further okay. at this stage. Thank you. Penny, if you I, want to go. I just had a question relating to the, the concept, because <laughs> it's a concept development application. So what's actually included in it? And I know Mr. Goff said earlier, but I thought it might be a planning question that concept development application covered just the concept and, um, you know, the subdivision, the roads, the rural um, land sharing communities, etc., would come later. Um, but just, just from my understanding from the application, the concept, as I understand it, does in fact cover um, the concept of land sharing communities and it also um, and I'm only looking I'm looking at the SEE at this stage also covers the notional road um, network the notional location of the 392 dwellings along the ridge lines in the 
various um, future lots. Um, there's been a number of studies accompanied the application, um, but, al but also things like the architectural um, design guidelines and so on. So does the does the, the concept actually cover all of those things? Like in approving the concept development application, would the panel be approving um, in principle anyway, the road network, the location of the 392 dwellings and everything else that's in the plans that um, have accompanied the application? Yeah, so the concept set to approve the highest and best use overall for the site. So that was done through the studies in confirming the, the ability for this site to deliver the number of dwellings, the services and the facilities associated with that number of dwellings. So while we've indicated and shown developable areas, those are developable areas to be further investigated to then confirm the delivery of dwellings within them. It's ultimately setting up a framework and a maximum up to number of dwellings for each of those communities. If through further investigation it was noted that either those numbers were not achievable or there were significant site constraints to certain areas, then those of the areas would not be developed. The concept doesn't lock in the delivery of those dwellings and the, and the specific location of those dwellings. They were just indicatively shown to prove and um, test the site as suitable for the development. Okay, well, secondly, though, um, you said um, that, that ultimately you, with the subdivision, future subdivision that's proposed, um, there'd be 10 rural land sharing lots, which with up to, I think you said 60 dwellings in each. So potentially um, subject to, you know, further assessment and so on and so forth, there could be 600 dwellings. Is that what you're saying? No, it, the density provisions under the state policy relate to the land area. So it depends on the land area of those lots at the subdivision stage. The maximum size, depending on the largest land area for one of those lots, had 62 dwellings. Some of the other communities only had nine dwellings, depending on their lot uh -huh. size. Right, so okay. 392 is the, is the upper limit achieved by the lots, the, the land size. Okay, fine. I get that. Thank you. That's an, that's all, Chair. Can I just this density issue seems so I'm just looking at the SEP now, seven one B. So the land the land that we're looking at is surely the land that's subject to this application. Is that not the case? And if that's the case, there is a maximum of eighty dwellings. The the, the, why, the interpretation why, why is the, why is that not a reasonable reading of, of what the SEP says? The, the, the interpretation Where, what, is, what, other land, what other land would be re, be referring to if it weren't the land that's the subject of the application? In, in following Mr Hemming's advice, the, the assessment of what the land is is at the time that the uh, community is sought to be approved, not at the concept stage. So looking at the land in that clause it's the land that results from the subdivision so each of these newly created lots will have a community rural land share community proposed upon it it will have a certain certain area and at that stage is the consideration of whether that density provision would be um, applied why is the land I referred to in the set the land, not the land that is the subject of this development application, this concept development application, which is an which is a development application. It's just a form of development application. Is that not correct? We, so the in, consent in, authority must not grant consent to development, and we are doing that by approving yes. or otherwise the concept. Is that correct? In, 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 sub, in clause seven, it, it discusses the land in A. And yeah, if you yeah. go to 41A, it also refers to the land, which, which, is, which is the subject of the, the barrister's advice about uh, yep. it must be a single lot of not more than 10 hectares. In, in, Mr. That, Hemming, yep. yeah, in Mr. Hemming's advice, the land you are looking at is the land in its subdivided form. 
which results from the proposed subdivision. So when you go to clause seven, it therefore you're applying that density control on the subdivided lot. I see. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Of course, as I say, there's general interest in how we interpret the density provision. Ned Wales, did you want to ask any questions of Mr Mulhern? Thanks, Mr Mulhern. Who's next, Mr Goh? Um, could I call our economist, you're, you're, Mr Mark? I don't interrupt you, but you've, you've got about another seven minutes. And it's important we hear about ecology, I think, because yeah, there's, you know, one of the reasons for refusal at a key factor in the SEP are ecological impacts. So we need time for that as well. If you could please be conscious of that. Yeah, and no, I'm just, uh, unfortunately, this is the prejudice we're, we're suffering because we have not been a, had an opportunity of responding to these inadequate information. But it, it might be that I think heritage and ecology are important. So if I could call Mr. David Robinson now, uh, Mr. Chairperson, um, to address the refusal grounds 3B, 7, 8, and 9. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairperson and the uh, panel members. Um, I've been called in as a peer reviewer to look over the ecological work that's been done and to look at the extent to which that sort of um, deals with some of the objections that have been raised about ecological impacts of the, uh, the, the concept that's been put before you today. Um, and I, I, I heard from Council that um, one of the concerns is that there would be up to 106 hectares of native vegetation cleared for, for, for the proposal and some additional indirect effects. There's also uh, likely to be a significant requirement if that were to be the case for offsetting. Um, and so I've ha had regard to that. I suppose one point that I think is worthwhile understanding it um, at the outset of my response is that um, <laughs> That's a part of the impacts, but there's also a lot of work that's being done under the proposal to preserve and enhance the ecology of the site. So the, the ecology of the site, um, which is 1,584 hectares in size, um, is such that there's a, a, over a thousand hectares of uh, bushland or, or bushland that can be potentially uh, restored, of which 100, 100 and something, 106 hectares is to be cleared. Obviously, the flip side of that is that for a site that's currently unmanaged, that doesn't have flora and fauna managed in it for, for conservation purposes, um, the flip side of that is that if this development takes place, then there will be a stewardship agreement that will be possible to be, be able to be set up over something like 905 hectares. So there'll be sort of permanent long-term conservation brought to bear uh, to deal with a lot of the ecological sort of impacts. I think that needs to be considered by the panel in conjunction with the ecological impacts. Um, the $27 million worth of um, offsets, um, I can't comment absolutely specifically on that number, except to say that I, I think broadly speaking, that's probably correct. But I also draw the panel's attention to the, the offsetting arrangements that would involve the creation of a stewardship site. And it's something like a, for 12% impacts on the native vegetation of the site, 88% will be conserved. And that includes the entirety of the, the mapped areas of um, endangered subtropical rainforest and extensive areas of the other two types of forest that currently occur on the site. So you would eventually have something like 88% of the site conserved. Um, and if it were to be conserved under a stewardship arrangement, um, that stewardship arrangement can provide um, some of the offset requirements required. And that would be a substantial contribution to that offsetting. Um, in terms of the concept plan, um, there's been a biodiversity development assessment report prepared, a, a so-called BDAR. And that VDAR is an indicative VDAR that illustrates what the flora and fauna values are of the site. 
and how they can be um, protected and enhanced in the longer term. And they also it also demonstrates that um, all of the major uh, communities and examples of all of the threatened species habitat that are known to occur on site can also be protected. Um, it's a it's a concept beta, and a, a and a beta is normally meant to take uh, to have regard to the absolute impacts of a proposed development. It's my understanding that as uh, each individual community area is developed, there would be a series of um, detailed BDARs that would actually consider in further detail um, the impacts of the site and important things such as uh, avoidance. So there's potential for further reshaping of the development area in the future to have um, a better environmental outcome. But if you were to take at face value the areas that are earmarked for uh, development versus conservation at the moment. Um, there's uh, the, the impacts of the development don't impact um, excessively, in, in my view, on any of the, the, the vegetation types, and uh, they don't eliminate from the site any of the threatened species that are known to occur. In fact, the, the, the biggest and most intact areas of native vegetation which tend to be on the east and the uh, sorry the west and the, the the northwest of the site would be uh, preserved and they'd be preserved in conjunction or adjacent to the national park. So um, it's a concept plan beta, and from my review of it, there's been an extensive amount of field survey work to to verify the nature and extent of habitats on site and to target and survey for a very wide variety of um, threatened species on site. So it's a very good baseline of information um, that would be added to um, as further work took place uh, for the individual community um, assessments uh, and, and their associated BDARs. Um, that's the main part of the overview that I wanted to present today. Um, I think there was also, I should say though, that there was also concern expressed about impacts on koalas and whether or not there was core koala habitat. Um, I can say from my understanding of the VDA is that koalas are known to occur in some of the habitats and they would require to be a, a, a koala plan of management. But it's also, in my view, it's not something that would be done up front as part of a sort of a concept plan at this stage. What, what do you say about the wildlife corridor functions, firstly? And secondly, would the stewardship and presumably revegetation of part of the 905 hectares, how would that affect the bushfire risk? So wildlife habitat and bushfire risk. Uh, Chair, I'm sorry, I believe that the doctor's just left the Meeting. Mr. Robertson, I suspect that trying to unmute, he's accidentally hung up instead. Paul, you might put that on, yes, you might put that on, put your team on eyes oh, back. Dr. Robertson. I'm, back. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm ringing from a remote location. My computer just shut okay. down, but I'm back Good on the phone. I beg your pardon. Right. On. Uh, yeah, look, just to, if you could comment on two things, please. The impacts on the wildlife corridor functions of the area of the development, including the stewardship that you've mentioned. And secondly, the impact of the stewardship program, which presumably includes some revegetation on bushfire risk. Yes, I understand. Firstly, with regard to the wildlife corridor, it's my understanding that there's a regional wildlife corridor that's been uh, mapped to occur on site. And I understand that those corridors were derived from a study that was done by a report uh, by Scott's and Drills Marts quite some time ago. And it was an indicative series of corridors. So it was based upon um, remote sensing and the corridors indicated areas where the authors sought you know, wildlife corridors were, were best suited. And there's part that goes across, I think, the southern portion of the site in a, an east-west direction. Um, 
the the BDAR, the concept BDAR has given some consideration to wildlife corridor functions and connectivity. Um, and I think if the, the, the concept plan were carried out um, to the letter with the exact areas that are shown on the, uh, you know, the, the current um, concept design and houses were built in some areas, then there would be some encroachment into the corridor that's mapped, um, the regional corridor that's mapped. Um, but it's also my understanding that um, it is quite possible to maintain a sort of a thorough and continuous link through the site without actually building upon that. So you could modify some of the community uh, designs uh, to miss the corridor if if that's absolutely required, because I, I believe there's a prohibition on the um, uh, the construction of dwellings and so forth on on the corridor itself. But I, I also um, point out from an ecological perspective, corridors are notional things. And this is a subjective um, description of one version of a corridor. And it goes across um, you know, a number of areas. It's not necessarily the best corridor that, that occurs um, in the site. And there are other, I believe, much more substantial corridors that run along the western side of the site in a north-south direction and on the, um, the, the southern side of the site and in, in the, the, the northwestern corner as it links to the, the National Park. So, uh, yes, I think um, the actual corridor that's been nominated as the formal corridor um, could be uh, encompassed by a, a revised version of the design, which could be, that, I think that, that would be becoming about in the latter stages of the development. So I'm a peer reviewer, so I'm not best suited to, to comment on the specifics of those designs. Um, in terms of bushfires, um, as individual biodiversity development assessment reports take place, um, they need to consider important things like avoidance, they need to consider important measures like um, bushfire impacts and indirect impacts of the development. That would all have to be factored in on a community by community basis. Um, you know, as as the um, the various development applications are, are unfurled, um, at the moment there's a high proportion of the site already has forest or forestry plantations on it, um, etc. Um, in the future, some of the revegetation will in, include things like revegetating with um, more mesic elements like rainforest elements, etc. So um, the revegetation undoubtedly has potential to affect bushfire risk uh, and it must be factored in. But I, I believe there's already a, a bushfire risk and the bushfire expert can talk further to that because there, there's already substantial forest on the, the, the overall site. Any further questions? Thanks, Mr. Dr. Robinson. Um, any further questions from panel members of Dr. Robinson? No, no. Uh, okay, thanks, Mr. Goff. Who, who's next? Thank you. Can, can I just ask one 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 point, um, Mr. Chair? Um, if you read refusal ground five of the council, there's an allegation that the clause says that development is on land that is a wildlife corridor, and I'm reading from the refusal ground. If you go to the clause itself, which is 4.1d, it says no building will be on land that is a wildlife uh, corridor. So there is a distinction between development um, and building. In my submission, we are not seeking consent for our building within a wildlife corridor. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if I know time's um, very uh, limited. Would you be assisted in asking questions of our heritage advisor about the cultural heritage refusal ground? Uh, I wouldn't, but maybe other members of the panel may have questions of that sort. Can can you just indicate whether that would is necessary or not? Anybody nod or shake heads, please? <laughs> no, I'm fine. No. I'm fine. Right. Okay, okay. So that person's excused. Thank you. All right. So um, I might ask our bushfire because I know that was a previous consideration yeah. of the panel. So could I ask Mr. Wayne had a way to unmute and put his uh, camera on? Yep. Okay. Now look, we'll, we'll we'll give you another ten minutes, but that's it. Right. All right. Thank you. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hadaway, please be aware of that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I, I just um, suppose a bit of make it brief. 
to start off with, the the bushfire um, planning was done in in consult consultation with the RFS and um, and in principle with their their um, their findings on the on the day of the site. We're in, we're going to have refuge places for each area of um, development, uh, which will assist in the the road egress and access points, um, limiting the, the impact from block roads. Um, and um, this is achieved through through having the dwellings placed either side of, of the road, which I've allowed for a 10 metre roadside setback, 20 metre building footprint and a 52 metre asset protection zone. This will give um, over an 80, 80 metre um, area of protection for the road for anyone coming and going. And each little um, hamlet type of development area will have a, a refuge building, which will be compliant with uh, planning for bushfire protection document. Um, one of the other things that were was brought up was Precinct 9 and 10. Um, again, we're going to have a refuge building there, um, compliant with the RFS, planning for bushfire protection. There's already a, a large cleared area, which is known as the amphitheater. Uh, that um, will be used there for for the uh, refuge building. Um, so any time that there is an issue of getting out of an area, um, the, there was a safe refuge to be taken up while the fire um, m m moves past the, the area. Um, another p point that was rude was moved that was um, additional community firefighting uh, as part of the um, community community management plan a lot of this will be addressed with tanks for static water supply at different locations um, firefighting equipment um, it also the management plan will also um, allow for Man, um, the ongoing maintenance of all the equipment and the water tanks. Um, um, and in relation to the bushfire things for precinct nine and ten, which is your office office area. These are, uh, are just site site office for um, construction workers, site office, um, amenities, lunch rooms. Um, and these uh, can be placed, if you've got a minute, just you allow me a second, I'll pull up a, a, um, a drawing of that area. So this is the area here that's been allotted for the the side office areas. As you can see, I've, I've placed uh, asset protection zones. I've kept it 40 metres away from the, the Tweed River. Um, 20 metre asset protection zone to the to the north, and 25 metres to the south. So there's there's um, a fair area here that that is usable to once of the final locations of, of these site offices um, have been identified can, can be placed in this area safely. Okay, thanks Mr Hadaway. Um, yeah, yeah I, I guess the problem is that the bushfire uh, 
rural fire service have not agreed that you're meeting the requirements of planning for bushfire protection? Well, they asked for additional information. Um, we did try to have a site meeting uh, with RFS and council and council um, wasn't available or couldn't make the meeting and therefore we, we didn't have it. But I believe it's all, all could be resolved. Um, and it, it's, it, as I said, it, it, it's in, in line with what was discussed at our initial um, site, site, on-site meeting. All right, thanks, Mr. Hadley. I'm sorry, there's some noise in the background. I've had to move, and I'm going to have to move again, which I'll do when we when we finish with the applicant. I apologise for that noise. Um, are there any questions from panel members of Mr. Hadaway? No, no. Okay, Mr. Goff, whoever you Thanks. your final speaker is, please. No, I, I might make it myself, just on the prohibition, um, Mr. Chair. So um, I'll be very short. There, there are three allegations of prohibition. The first is that. We are not development on a single lot um, for three or more dwellings. The second that our that we are development relies on and is interconnected to development on other lots. And the third is about the wildlife corridor, which I've already addressed you on. Um, in regards to the the first question, you you have advice from senior council from both parties. They are both preeminent uh, barristers in New South Wales. Um, I won't speak to them. They speak for themselves, and I would ask that you consider them carefully. Um, I have not had time to consider the inter-department legal advice, but I understand it, it prefers the advice of Mr. Robinson, but I would ask you to, to look at Mr. Hemming's um, clear and succinct advice. And in my view, it is, is the correct interpretation. If Mr. Hemming's advice is followed, of course, the, the panel would be within power to approve the application. It would be development on a single lot uh, for three or more dwellings when you consider that the subdivision that will occur. Um, and as I alluded to previously, it would also be development that would comply with the density caps because you're looking at the land as it applies post subdivision. Um, all I can say with who, whose advice to prefer, um, Mr. Robinson relies strongly on a, a decision of United Church for v Parramatta. And it is interesting to note that Mr. Hemmings was in fact the barrister for Parramatta Council in that matter, and he was successful in, in his argument. So um, if, if Mr. Hemmings would understand the, the intricacies of that judgment um, and, and would understand what was argued before, before the court. If Mr. Robinson is correct, um, the practical response from my client uh, would be the lodgement of a number of applications. We would first seek to lodge applications to subdivide the land. We will then seek applications to construct the roads. We then have to lodge 10 separate applications on these newly created lot, uh, allotments for the rural land share community. In, in my view, this is completely contrary to the purpose of a concept development application. And indeed, it, it in no way furthers the aims of the, of the schedule of, of the set because um, it would be a disjointed approach. There would be no um, of the benefits of virtues of doing this together. For example, the architectural design guidelines and the, 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 the benefits that flow through this concept. Um, that is, uh, the, the second question is the interconnection of, of lots and somehow that acts as a prohibition. In my view, that is not a prohibition. The lots are connected by, by roads, which are permissible. They have community facilities that are independently um, permissible. Um, and the, 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 the approval would be for the approval of dwellings on lots. And dwellings, as the, the panel knows, are defined as, as rooms or suite of rooms that are, that, that are capable of domiciles. There is no reliance on other lots to achieve that purpose of dwelling. So in my view, the, the prohibition uh, alleging that we're relying on other lots uh, is, is, is not founded. Um, that is all I wish to say. Thank you. Mr. Goff, what do you say if we were to take into account the department's uh, legal opinions that have been provided today? I, I was given this 10 minutes before we started, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I, I have not, I have had no opportunity of, of revealing it. I understand it, it prefers the advice, it, it, it finds the question arguable and, and gives a conclusion that the court um, may not follow Mr. Robinson, but it prefers Mr. Robinson's reasoning. So uh, without having reviewed these documents and ascertaining whether the, it's factually correct and in line with the law, I can't make any comment on it. So you're not saying that we can't have regard to it? 
well, I'm prejudiced because I haven't I haven't read it and reviewed it. And I mean, if you provided it to the applicant so we could respond to you, then I I can't I can't do that. I mean, it's a it's a department advice. Um, so it's it's a matter for you. I mean, usually I, this probably was a confidential legal advice that you obtained, and we wouldn't have the benefit of reviewing it. So I, I appreciate that you've given us this opportunity, but I just I can't make comment on it because I, I haven't reviewed it. Yeah, but okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Goff and applicant team. That was very informative. Um, we'll go now, and again, I apologise for the, the noise. We will now go to um, the submitters, and I'll get my list. Denise Nestle, you're first on the list, I believe. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you please uh, proceed and give us your submission? Yes. Yeah, this is you. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking for the Northern Rivers Guardians, which is a community association with more than 700 members who are dedicated to environmental protection and sustainable development. I've been appointed to present the concerns that group members identified when they reviewed the DA for the concept plan and council's assessment report. We agree with council's recommendation to refuse this DA and we have additional points to make about the concept plan. And we note that that plan does include the expectation that dwellings and associated development will be constructed on the property. So first, not only is the proposed development inconsistent with the 2019 SEP for primary production rural development, which has been discussed so far, as Council states, but allowing close to 400 dwellings to be built in a remote rural area, we think would be highly irresponsible. The state policy allows far fewer dwellings on one land share property than this DA proposes, as you have been discussing just in the last few minutes. We think this DA aims to get around that limitation by creating the 10 interconnected communities within the property. And that will massively increase the total number of dwellings to be built. We don't think the state policy was meant to guide that development. We think it was meant to guide the development of clusters of dwellings on small communally owned land, not to facilitate housing developments for 750 to 1500 people. So we think of this proposal as a proposal to add the equivalent of another UCI to the area. And that goes far beyond just being inconsistent with state policy. It would have predictable as well as unpredictable environmental impacts. Second, although the proposed development is comparable to the town of UCI in size, the developers would provide no real centralized power or water or sewage treatment. As we understand it, these off-grid utilities would all have to be supplied by the people who build the dwellings. Small numbers of self-sufficient dwellings can certainly be manageable in a rural area, but to allow almost 400 off-grid dwellings in this area we think would be very imprudent. We note that council's assessment report says there is insufficient information to determine if the development will have, an, will have an impact on water quality in the area. But if this DA is approved, if the concept plan is approved, the owners of each proposed dwelling will be deciding on their own how to dispose of their black and gray effluent. We find it difficult to imagine how council will be able to properly assess and monitor 400 separate sewage systems, assuming that all the homeowners comply with accepted treatment methods and standards. Any non-compliance will have ongoing detrimental effects to the soil and water in the area and potential health risks to those who live on or near the property. In particular, the upper catchment areas of the Tweed River and Burrell Creek will be affected if any of that effluent is washed into those waters, and we suspect that will very likely happen if this is approved. We know the council's assessment report references the 2019 state policy with regard to water management, but there's no reference to the bores proposed in the DA. The DA states that bores 
can and probably will be used to supply at least some water to the dwellings, in addition to the rainwater tanks that the proponents are recommending for each dwelling. The use of bores could result in ongoing unmonitored water extraction, which would have an impact on the area's aquifers. This too will present a monitoring challenge for council and the proponents have provided no independent assessment of the expected impacts to the aquifers. Furthermore, each household will need to supply its own power and that raises still more concerns. Solar systems are mentioned in the DA, but households could decide to use generators and many are likely to rely on wood fires for cooking and heating, all of which would introduce additional risks to health and safety in the remote area. So we think it would be highly unwise to allow an off-grid development of this size and leave Tweedshire to ensure that all of those utilities will be managed effectively by the 400 individual households. Third, in order to prepare this large property for development, a sizable system of internal roads will have to be constructed to replace and add to the logging trails that now exist on the land. This will involve removing great numbers of trees and bringing in many tons of road-based material, operations that will have significant environmental impacts. Council noted in its assessment report that they could not assess the proposed internal roads because of insufficient information. We think it would be irresponsible to approve this concept plan without knowing the full details of the future internal road network. Fourth, it seems to us that this development would have no clear benefits to the Shire, and we know that Council concluded that the development is not in the public interest. We further note that the DA states the development will satisfy, quote, an increasing demand for alternative and diverse housing, unquote, in Tweedshire. Well, there is a demand for affordable housing in Tweedshire and across the state of New South Wales, but there's no evidence that people are clamoring to buy into a rural land sharing community and then build a self-sufficient dwelling on land to which they do not have freehold title. We also note that the 2019 state policy states that one aim of that policy is, quote, creating opportunities for an increase in rural population in areas that are experiencing population loss. That's a point that has been raised so far. Well, we know that according to the New South Wales government, Tweedshire's population increased more than 7% from 2011 to 2016 with people over 65 being the segment with the highest increase. Current estimates indicate that the population of the Shire will increase by more than 35% in the next 20 years. Now I've got uh, references for those two websites if you want them. I just Googled population in Tweedshire. If the projected increase continues the trend of high percentages of over 65s, then the need for a self-sufficient land sharing community or a series of communities in a rural area will diminish further. Few people of retirement age are seeking to build and maintain an off-grid communally owned property in a rural area with all of the physical challenges and inconveniences living on such a property involves. And I know because I have been involved in one of those. In fact, entering into a rural land sharing arrangement is not the aspiration of the large majority of people in this area, or I would maintain across the state. So we don't think this development comes close to meeting actual market demand or need for housing in the Shire. Fifth and last, we are concerned about the ambiguous statements in the DA regarding ownership of the land on which the dwellings are to be constructed. The DA describes communal ownership, but does not make the ownership structure clear. And we have gone through that document very, very carefully to try to figure out what the structure of ownership would be. We cannot figure it out. And the DA also does not specify just how the proposed land sharing communities will be established and managed. There are just a lot of very general statements about people sharing an interest in a community. This is not addressed in council's assessment report, but
but we raised a number of questions about it in our written submission, that is the Northern Rivers Guardian's written submission. I won't repeat those questions here, but I urge you to review them. They remain unanswered and the ambiguity remains a major concern because if you approve this, then you are approving an unknown quantity in terms of just what this ownership is. And Mr. Mitchell, you said earlier, what are we approving here? And that's what I'm asking too. What are you being asked to approve? In conclusion, the Northern Rivers Guardians agree with Tweed Shire Council that this DA is not supported by the relevant state policy and that raises significant concerns. I've addressed only a few today and haven't even gotten into the environmental concerns, which also uh, bother us considerably. We firmly support council's recommendation to refuse this and we thank you for considering our group's perspectives. So, thank you very much, Ms. Nettle. C could I just ask you to comment on whether you have any comments on Dr. Robertson's submissions, particularly in relation to the opportunity for um, the offsets to provide a better managed and higher diversity outcomes? Well, I think there are so many problems that that we have identified that would occur if close to 400 self-sufficient dwellings were to be allowed to be placed on that land wherever they're placed. I don't see how some offsets would offset the impact of all of that going on. The internal road construction, the development of, again, self-sufficient housing. This is not a subdivision with reticulated water and sewage treatment, with footpaths and streetlights and all the things that one would expect from a centralized, uh, well-planned development. This is 400, build your own property, build your own dwelling, figure out how to do the sewage treatment. And I know that these are all supposedly details that would be worked out in future DAs. I understand that that would be the response of the proponents. But this is a concept plan that says, okay, this whole idea makes perfectly good sense and surely you'll be able to work out the details of the sewage treatment on 400 separate lots. Each of those people will get to decide on their own what to do. And the same with the water, you know, the water supply, the power supply and so forth. Uh, I, I, I don't see how ecologically and environmentally any of this makes sense and it doesn't matter to me you know what whether the wildlife corridor is just an indicative wildlife corridor or an actual one that's being used by the wildlife it doesn't make any sense to allow this development on that property any further questions from panel members no uh, um, maybe just a comment. Um, just thank you, uh, uh, Denise, for your input there. Um, I noticed you referred to the population loss issue, which I raised earlier. Um, you made mention of the fact that the New South Wales government uh, uh, data suggested that Tweed is experiencing and is predicted to experience significant population increase. That's that's understood. Um, I think I think the point the applicants would make is that the uh, references in the relevant uh, state policy are to probably a more localised area within Tweed Shire as a whole. So if we're looking at a rural area, we're looking at that rural hinterland of Tweed. Um, so the only comment I'd make there is that I, I wasn't really uh, convinced by information provided by, by anybody so far. So my limited research of the matter is that the area probably known as um, <coughs> Yukai Southwest Tweed, which is the sort of rural area in the hinterland of um, Tweed Shire. Um, its population, uh, if you look at the period, say, between um, 2016 and now, the estimated resident population is pretty static. It's certainly not in decline, uh, which is probably unusual for a rural hinterland. But I um, uh, just wanted to sort of clarify that I don't think um, as a panel, we could take on board the, the growth over the entire Shire. I think when we look at this, we have to consider the rural hinterland. Um, and, and that's not to say that there's loss happening there from what I can see, but that's just a, an observation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
And thank you very much, Ms. Nessel. Uh, next speaker is um, Ms. Riley. Helen Riley, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you Ms. hear Riley, me? Uh, we can. You've got three minutes, if you could please be conscious All of that. All right. I'll, so. I'll, be, I'll be speaking quickly. Um, I strongly object to this DA. My concerns around the impact this DA will have on the wildlife and the habitat within the scope of works, which I think will significantly encroach on the wildlife corridor, and I believe there are buildings within that area. This is a major wildlife corridor running through this proposed development. This corridor connects Mebane National Park with the Nightcap Range National Park. Within this corridor, there are at least 21 threatened fauna species and seven flora. It has also been identified that there is a need for further assessments of 48 threatened and endangered species of flora and fauna. The reason being that it's been found that preferred habitat exists in the areas proposed for development as well as foraging and hunting areas. Throughout this development, there's at least nine um, significant species for um, koala feed trees. There's no mention of the development, and how it will affect the platypus population. I'd like to draw your attention to the State Environment Planning Policy Schedule 5, Section 4, Subsection D, which we've been talking about. The Consent Authority may, develop, may grant development if satisfied of the following. D, no building on this land that is a wildlife refuge wildlife corridor, wildlife management area, and the development will not adversely affect such lands. This development does not satisfy this requirement. As I stated, a major wildlife corridor runs through this development. Within the wildlife corridor, there are plans for development of hundreds of dwellings and kilometres of roads, which will completely sever this vital corridor and destroy valuable habitat, which sustains the biodiversity and safety in which the wildlife moves through and lives on displacing the wildlife. To satisfy this requirement, the proponents want to move the wildlife corridor that cuts through the development to the lower southwest edge of the property. This will be at least two thirds smaller in size than the current naturally occurring wildlife corridor. The area they are wanting to move it to is surrounded by paddocks and sparse vegetation on its left. And on the right is a proposed hundreds of dwellings and roads of the development. This would be an unsafe area for vulnerable wildlife and would be extremely unlikely that the wildlife would take this option. Also, this newly moved wildlife corridor will have one of the major entry roads, which would be access to over possible 200 houses, cutting completely through it, placing increased risk of wildlife becoming injured or roadkill from increased traffic. To think this is a quick fix to just move the corridor on a map is quite mind boggling. There is no feasibility study or how they will practically relocate the corridor. And it's more about getting this existing corridor removed from the scope of works. I would also like to note that in their marketing material, they have mentioned it today, that they also talk about utilising and cutting down 600 acres of eucalypt blackbutt plantation in the southeast of the property for building and money making. And this species is noted to be have significance for koalas. I'd like to point out that this is where they propose to move the wildlife corridor, but they're planning to cut down the trees within it. The deforestation within this corridor will be massive. Roads, dwelling sites and other planned enterprises within the development site. This planned development will adversely affect or worse still destroy the current wildlife corridor and put many threatened species at risk of extinction in the area and severely impact all species. I don't think this DA does satisfy the Schedule 5, Section 4, Subsection D of the SEP. On this alone, the DA should be rejected. And can I also note, you know, the high probability of the introduction of hundreds of domestic cats and dogs would be devastating to this wildlife. And also, th this area, um, I grew up here in the 70s, and it was just lots of paddocks. Um, I never saw a koala. I've returned back in the last 10 years and I've had koala, I'm, I live in the Mount Burrell area and I've had koalas passing through so, and living within the area. So it's a significant area and, you know, koalas are, you know, in such a dire, dire straits and we really need to be trying to preserve this wonderful, yeah, wildlife and nature that we have. Thank you for Thanks allowing me to speak. No, that's what, that's, uh, no, that's, uh, very helpful. Thank you for your submission. I have no questions. Do any other pan panel members have questions? If no, okay. Thank you. You're off the hook, Ms. Riley. Thank you for your input. Um, Ms. Milsom.
Lynn Milton, are you there? Chair, that's the call, the seminar I'll have to call. I'll call her immediately. Okay, well, while you're doing that, uh, should we have Nola Firth or would that be too long? Maybe Mr. McConville, you're next. Are you there, Mr. McConville? Hello. Hi. Yes, who have we got? Hi, this is Lisa Foley. You're live in the meeting now. Oh, thanks, so, Lisa. Um, Ms. Hello, Mills, Brandon. Your... Hello. Oh, no, yeah. Yes, I am. Do you Ms. want me Milson, to tell you? My name's Lynn Milton. I... Yes, and we'd like to hear from you, and you have three minutes if you could be conscious of that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to speak for all the animals, birds and reptiles that don't have a voice in this process. Um, the DA 210010 is not suitable for this land. Please don't approve this development. 392 homes would cause untold damage to the habitat of many endangered animals. Koalas and echidnas, uh, they're vulnerable as we speak. Native creatures of wallabies, dingoes, paddy melons, Antichinus, goannas, just to name a few. Gliders and many birds reside in the trees, which will be removed to make way for the houses. There is a wildlife corridor running through the middle of this development, which has been used by koalas and many other species. Removing so many trees would mean disaster for countless animals, birds and reptiles. Mm. Houses would involve cars and people. Wildlife would be impacted by domestic dogs and cats. The road construction of 37 kilometres by six metres wide would impact our waterways where platypus live and would be harmful substantially. Fire risk is very high. Access to this property is very limited with only two access points, one being on a blind steep corner and would be unsafe as it is now. Traffic numbers used in Cuyahoga Road which is already crumbling under the traffic numbers would be a financial burden to Tweedshire Council. Increased traffic through Yukai Village would severely impact the town and the school. This development is not in keeping with the country lifestyle. This is a town and we don't need a town and will not be embraced by the local community. Thank you for listening and hoping for a favourable outcome. Thank you Thanks, Miss Milson. Thank you, Miss Milson. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I have no questions. Do any other panel members have questions? No. Thanks, Miss Milson. Um, Noel, you you're speaking. You're speaking on behalf of the Caldera Environment Centre. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Shall I go you ahead? 15, yes, please. You've got fifteen minutes. I've got 15 minutes. Uh, uh, that's more than I thought I had. Thank you. Look, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Caldera Environment Centre. It's an environment that uh, has been uh, in the in the Tweed area for um, over 30 years now, and uh, we have members from within the Shire. Um, we are extremely and about this, about this uh, development application and we wish to strongly support the Tweed Shire Council um, assessment. Um, the Tweed Shire is, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, within our Shire World Heritage uh, environment. Uh, we are one of the biodiversity hotspots in Australia um, with uh, 54 endemic species, we have this really precious and internationally significant environment. And uh, as a community, we have uh, a, a very high responsibility to uh, maintain and indeed restore this environment, particularly in the face of the mass extinctions that are going on now and in the face of climate change. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Tweed Shire Council has embedded in its um, policies and strategies uh, that the need to and the responsibility to maintain and uh, look after this environment and all of its um, development 
is must be in all the strategies it says that it must not impact on uh, our precious environment and so this particular development application is uh, one that uh, you know it seems quite extreme to us that there would be uh, some what looks what you know 392 dwelling plots which can turn into dwellings so that's 392 houses that can happen on uh, an area which is zoned rural and which has um, uh, an important uh, wildlife corridor on it. Seems just, you know, something that's um, astonishing and extremely worrying. Uh, I mean, 392 developments, uh, houses would uh, include uh, domestic animals, dogs, cats, road, other infrastructure. And, you know, for it not to be impacting on the environment nearby is not possible at all. And then, you know, there's been the assessment by the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, their Biodiversity and Conservation Division, saying that, you know, if, if they were to actually cost the loss of the, of the environment, that it would be $27 million. And, and uh, you know, I mean, that is, that is huge. A and, uh, uh, that's 106 hectares and their words are pristine native vegetation and uh, you know they talk as well about and in fact the applicants agree that there are many threatened uh, species and it includes fauna flora and amphibians in that in that area it's a it's a red flag area in in the, in the uh, legislation um, there is koala habitat, um, and uh, there's as well as 106 pristine native vegetation. There's also 220 hectares of lower level vegetation. But let's talk about the pristine native vegetation. It's becoming more and more precious, more and more rare in the whole of the world. And you know, it's it, all of the uh, there's legislation there already to protect it, and so to suddenly contravene any of that would be very, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's just, it's just we just very much hope that it would never be done. Um, the idea that you can kind of shift a wildlife corridor or, um, uh, you, you know, plant things elsewhere, restore it, uh, in the in the Samuel report, you know, in the Envi uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act um, review, he is saying that offsets, you know, the time for offsets, uh, kind of trying to shift things around like that is gone because we are already losing the species and they won't come back. It is just so, so important. Um, so. And, and then if I, I'd like to say, you know, the, the person who is doing the peer review for the applicant is saying that, that, that the looking at the environment was done carefully, but I'm not convinced because um, uh, according to uh, the council, two threatened species were left off of the native mouse and rat kangaroo. Um, and there are inconsistencies which we presented in our uh, submission, which I know that you will have read already, but the in inconsistencies were in the extent of the land restoration, if you do the sums, it didn't uh, it didn't add up. So, and it was to the detriment of the land restoration. And we know things like waterway buffers haven't been spoken about at all. So, and then the, and so the conclusion that's been reached um, uh, after consulting, you know, the state, and I imagine taking into account federal law as well, is that there is serious and irreversible impacts. Um, and you know that it matters. It matters so much. I think so. Um, uh, we are we are urgently we are urging you urgently. Uh, please do not approve this development application um, at this time uh, when you know looking after the environment is so important to our shire and to the whole world, of course. And I mean, if it did get approved, then. It would be a precedent that would be, you know, a really shocking one. So um, I, I've uh, confined my reports to the environment because that's our that's our particular field. So thank you very much.
Ms. Firth, thank you for your helpful submission. Can I just ask you one point of clarification? You mentioned that the area is a global hotspot or an ecological hotspot. What, what, what are you relying on there? Is that some sort of formal categorization? I've got one in mind, but I don't want to lead you. Is there a formal designation? Uh, I don't. Uh, we can uh, reference. Yes, I see. No, I, I don't. Uh, I can say to you, and I can send you a reference for the fact that we have um, uh, 54 uh, endemic species here, that, uh, species that live only here, um, which we are well recognised, and, and you'll find that it's explicit in, in the council um, documents and, and website and so on, that we are an important... We, I mean, you, you will know that we have World Heritage uh, land here. Um, uh, to find you, a, uh, uh, I mean, it's often said that we're the third highest biodiversity hotspot, uh, and that the other two are, I think, Kakadu and uh, Southwestern Australia. But uh, I, I can't actually give you a, uh, something that says that that, uh, that we are the third, but I know that we're very high. So that's not the IUCN that you're relying on, there is the authority? Uh, probably not, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any any other panel members have any questions of Ms Firth? No? Okay, thank you very much, Ms Firth. Thank you. Um, Mr McConville, Stuart McConville, are you there? Mr. McConville? No, okay. Ms. Renison, Marley Renison, are you there? No, Ms. Renison. Um, there is nobody else on my registered list of speakers. Have I missed anybody? Lisa oh. Foley. No, that's the full list, sir. That's it, that's the list then. Okay, um, I will just give the applicant and the council an opportunity. Pardon me? I'll just give the applicant and the council to respond to any of the things, the points that have been made by the residents that have made submissions, if they choose to do that. Maybe you'd like to go first, Mr. Gavin. And also, while you're doing that, can you please um, respond to the applicant's concern that the council didn't ask for additional information? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the reason behind that is um, given that we received that very, very high level advice that the development was in fact prohibited. So we thought that um, it would be um, uh, a saving for the applicant if we didn't go back and ask for extensive information, knowing that the our advice was that it was actually prohibited. So uh, we thought it thought it uh, it'd be a, a be, a, be a better approach from us not to go back and ask the applicant to go to what would likely to be a lot of expense about additional information and further studies and or probably modification of applications and all those types of things. Um, when we knew that the application was prohibited. So that was their thinking behind that. Um, commenting on Thank the... You. Any, 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 any. Yeah. Um, I, not particularly, not from the residents uh, or from the, um, the submitters. Um, Maybe just, I mean, there was being brought up about the wildlife corridor. And the wildlife corridor is mapped, and from, from our understanding, the wildlife corridor stretches across um, the, what, the southern uh, western part of the property, which does uh, go across uh, building sites and all, certainly got roads through it as well. So I'm not sure if Mr. Robertson, whether he's referring to the same wildlife corridor or the one that's, that's, um, been referred to, um, but yeah, so the, our information is that there's building sites and roads that go through that wildlife corridor. And so that Mr. Goff brought up that it talks about buildings, but there's a second part of the 
of that clause. It also talks about that the development will not as adversely affect any such land as well. So there's a two two parts to it, but we would say that our information is that the wildlife corridor um, uh, stretches across a, a part of the site where there is both dwelling sites and also roads as well, uh, and possibly other uh, community building there as well. So um, not not just we would say that there would be future buildings in that area at least. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Nothing really from the uh, uh, other than the, what the uh, residents had talked about. Um, I guess just some observations about Mr. Robinson seem to be talking about that the development could be shaped in future about a stewardship site and things like that. I guess that raises a lot of curious questions in terms of how would that actually come about and um, if is that managed across the 10 ultimate 10 sites um, and how would that be coordinated between 10 different communities, a stewardship site in terms of management, funding, um, what happens, is there sinking funds, what happens if one sinking fund exhausts and does the next community get access to that? And um, I don't know, it raises a lot more questions, I think, than than probably what we know the answers to. Um, I guess also on that sort of note, uh, the in relation to the um, some of the ecology matters, the the um, the relevant department from the state government, being the Department of Planning, Industry, and Environment, Biodiversity and Conservation Division. One of their comments was that the proposal does not demonstrate an, avo an avoid approach to biodiversity impacts, but would rather result in a very high biodiversity offset requirement. Um, and so then our assessment also goes on to say the development would re would be rejected on the should be rejected on the basis that the proposal would create significant environmental impacts on both the natural and built environments due to a excessive direct loss of native vegetation and threatened fauna habitat indirect adverse effect on ecosystem function and integrity, which cannot be adequately compensated for within the study area through habitat reconstruction. So it creates a tension in terms of your re rehabilitating, but also a planning problem too, is that the more rehabilitation you do or reconstruction of habitat brings in bushfire controls and things like that as well. So um, how would all that really take shape if there was an attempt to re um, reforest or replant? From a compensation point of view across the site. It is a large site, but they, they are certainly things that you would need to know um, at this stage of the assessment. Um, I also just know um, our ecologist Michael Banks has popped up on the screen there. So if you, the chair did mind, if Michael had some um, anything else to add to assist the panel deliberating on those ecology issues, if you if you'd like him to chime in. I'm very happy for him to chime in, but I don't want him to chime into the extent of adding new information, but I'm happy for him to respond to what's been said by the applicant or any of the submitters. Okay, have you listened in, Michael, to this point? Look, I have, and, and through the chair, if I may, and to the panel, um, I, I would just like to quickly respond to Dr. Robinson's comments about the wildlife corridor, of course. And uh, look, the uh, the wildlife corridor is certainly referenced in um, you know in multiple documents, including the Far North Coast Regional Conservation Plan. There is no other mapping that we have available. Um, to, 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 that's to, that's called a, a wildlife corridor, corridor essentially, or there's been no modelling done since um, since that 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 wildlife corridor mapping was um, released, and and so um, and looking at the at that particular corridor that's been mapped by Scott, it's 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 a kilometre wide, in uh, and it does narrow off between Mabin National Park and Nightcap. Um, whereas the proposed corridor that's achievable under the current development layout proposal is diminished quite significantly um, and does, it, it's basically confined, there's this narrow pinch point between two of the, the, um, the, the development um, footprints that are shaded in, in pink. And if I'd also like to talk to the stewardship agreements now, when you turn to the layout plan, the concept layout plan, you've got two, there's two two areas. There's one of conservation, which is shaded in dark green, 
And there's another that is shaded in light green, which is designated open space. Now, the proposed stewardship areas capture both the, the dark green, so the conservation areas, and the open space areas. There's been scant information about these open space areas. Um, are they for recreational pursuits? Um, are they to be, it's suggested that they're high, to be highly um, uh, revegetated um, densely to meet, you need to meet the um, offset parameters for a stewardship site. You need to basically recreate habitat um, in all structural forms and, and, and floristic assemblage. Um, and to do that in an open space area, I would imagine will be quite different if you're looking to pursue other other types of, of uses within those areas. Um, I'd also like to say that the plantation areas, which is referenced in the um, in the statement of environmental effects and also in the BDAR, we've there's no uh, I think in the statement of environmental effects it indicates that that plantation permit has actually lapsed over a larger proportion of the site. What we understand is there's two um, two plantation permits. One is active, that's managed by state forests. They have a have some interest in, in that particular permit. And there's a second that appears to have lapsed as, as per the statement environmental effects. And, um, and curiously, some of those plantation areas also capture the areas under the stewardship agreements as well. Um, so, and to get to, to be able to meet your stewardship agreement um, requirements, often um, to retire your credits, a site that's completely devoid of any vegetation or that's been heavily, heavily or selectively logged isn't going to meet um, the standard that that will likely be required by the state to be used for steward as a stewardship site. So there's certainly flaws in, in from what we can see in terms of delivering on site um, offsetting, and um, and and to come back to Lindsay's point about avoid and minimise, that's a fundamental principle of the Biodiversity Conservation Act, and. Uh, we have what's called a development control plan, DCP A19, and under clause 7.13, section six of the Biodiversity Conservation Act, it allows councils to um, prepare their own development control plans to do just that, to have de development controls to avoid and minimise. And this proposal has clearly not demonstrated that it can meet those principles. The development control plan underpins the local environmental plan and the aims of the local environmental plan, which is to um, enhance and maintain um, the ecological values of the Tweed. Um, so, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, we'll just go to the applicant. Thanks, Mr. Gavin, too. Um, we'll just go to the applicant now and uh, applicant um, um, do you want to respond to any of the submissions that have been made either council well, or Mr Chair, or is the purpose area? is the purpose of me presenting now about responses to the objections or the additional evidence the council has put on then? Because I am somewhat cons well, I am somewhat concerned Both. because we now have the opportunity. We, we've now been informed that we were not provided that opportunity um, because council were trying to save us money. However, that 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 should have been a decision of the applicant. Um, we now have the ecologists of council providing further allegations of insufficient information. So I'll have to get Mr. Robinson back to actually respond to those because it should be in any setting that the council put forward their reasons for refusal and we had the opportunity of responding, but the, the, the allegations keep on, keep on changing. But if I could just concentrate on the matters raised by the objectors. Firstly, um, there are three, three grounds I'd wish to draw your attention to. There was talk about domestic animals and there was a talk about generators, they are clearly matters that can be addressed by conditions of consent. There is this talk about a shifting corridor or wildlife corridor. And I would like you to draw attention to the BDAR that has been submitted and in particular page 26. We are not creating a new corridor. We are 
saying that the corridor as mapped on the regional plan is not correct because it goes through areas that are disturbed by plantation and that are disturbed by lantana. So the more appropriate mapping would be through the corridor that we've established. However, if you uh, allow me, I will ask Mr. Robinson to come back and address what has been now put before the panel. Um, in respect of the objections, um, could I call Mr. Mark Courtney, because I do want to address the panel on this need for the development and also this um, concern that there's no evidence about a loss of population. So with your leave, could I call Mr. Mark Courtney to give some evidence? You could do that and uh, we can hear from Dr. Robinson again as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and the panel. Um, I'll be very succinct. Michael Plan were asked to do an economic needs assessment for this work. In doing so, we found a number of key issues that I think are very relevant to today's discussion. Um, we found that the project will assist with the achievement of dwelling and population targets, uh, specifically as set out in the North Coast Regional Plan 2016. Uh, in the absence of nightcap, it's highly conceivable those targets aren't going to be reached. Um, the plan quite clearly sets out a, a, a particular figure over the next 15 years, which to break it down annually is around 580 dwellings per annum, which are required under the plan. Um, our research showed that you're currently sitting at around about 520 over the last four years or five years or so. Um, and over the last 10 years, it's 470. You've got a shortfall on your hands. It's worse than that because when you look at the dwelling monitor, it's sitting at around about 330 odd. You've got a major, major shortfall coming up. Now, what does that mean on top of a current housing crisis? Well, let me tell you, it's all about housing affordability, which is already really, really bad by any metric you want to look at. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about whichever one you want to choose. It's in dire straits. You've got 10 times multiplier of your average median household income to try and afford the median house price in the tweed. 10 times. Um, an acceptable rate would probably be around three or four or five. So you've got some major issues there. You've got affordability, which is impacted by lack of supply. This is only going to get worse in the absence of nightcap. I can't see how it's going to get any better. Um, in terms of housing choice, whether it's location, typology, um, whichever way you want to look at it, again, how is that going to align with those policies that are there in the Tweed Shire and all your planning documents? How's that going to be um, su supported by um, a decision to make nightcap uh, a no-go zone? So there's a number of things that are happening there, but most of all, um, with regards to um, Stephen's comment about the population, um, and this talks about isolation as well, right? So we're talking about um, within the SEP, um, Section 5, Article 2, I think it was, that we were talking about. We're trying to encourage the use of economic use of social infrastructure. Now, if you've got an ageing demographic, if you've got an ageing demographic, over time, the efficient use of social infrastructure actually dwindles. Not only that, but you have a lower participation rate in the labour force, you have disincentives, and you have a whole knock-on effect of an economy that's looking kind of pear-shaped. So what you need is an injection of something that's going to make the demographic profile something more amenable to the use of your social infrastructure, i.e. you need young people coming in. You need young families who can afford to buy, who can set up businesses and promote the use of social infrastructure. So the whole idea about isolation is really a bit of a furphy. You need young people coming in to change that demographic profile. Um, it's pretty clear. It's based on you know evidence all over Australia and international. Um, so without that injection of a young demographic coming in, you're going to have an aging population, an unaffordable housing situation, low choice, and this whole situation is not going to get any better. So this is a, a real case study on how you can improve a whole bunch of social and economic issues right here, right now. The final thing I'll say with regards, Stephen, about that population dwindling, it's not necessarily about the population dwindling, it's about the, the idea that over time, if you've got an aging population, the population will decline. Um, the projections, the official projections for the Tweed Shire show that 
In 2016, the population cohort of 65 and plus represented 23% of the total. The projection to 2036 shows it grows to 2031, it goes to 31%, so a five, five, a, a, an 8% kick over a very short period of time. It's pretty dramatic. So the Shire already has a, a very high median age. I think it's around 47. And that's only going to get worse. If you, if you follow it forward for another 15 years, you're up for almost 50% of the population will be over 65 years of age. That requires an enormous amount of health infrastructure, enormous amount of funding, a lack of participation, labour force, and I could go on. But they're, they're the key issues. So it's about affordability, it's about choice, it's about providing uh, some sort of solution to housing supply crisis that's already in the, in the, in the coast. So um, I think that's the key points. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can others who are interjecting, can they please refrain from doing so? Um, we ask the questions, please do not interject while speakers are speaking. Mr. Goff, you wanted uh, Dr. Robinson to come back as well. Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chairperson. I'm, I'm hoping he's still on the, the line. Mr. Robinson, if you are, are you able to unmute? There he is. Yes, I am. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Did you, did, I can. Did you hear um, the comments of Council's ecologists just then? Um, yes, I did. Are you able to respond to um, any? Yes, I can. Uh, could I just explain for the, uh, the panel? There was a question that the panel asked of one of the presenters about the, uh, I suppose, the biodiversity of the area and the outstanding biodiversity. I'd just like to clarify that briefly because um, when in northeastern New South Wales, it's one of the interim biogeographic -ge regions of Australia. And it's uh, also in an area that's known as the Maclay McPherson overlap, which is an area of eastern Australia that, that gets um, species of plants and animals that are typical of warmer climates in you know northern Australia uh, extending down into New South Wales and overlapping with the distributions of species that are more typical of cooler climates and so it has an enriched biodiversity so th that point that was raised is true and it applies to you know northeastern New South Wales that, uh, and, and it, it, it's you know part of um, a sort of a biogeographic realm in response to the, the comments raised by council, um, there were comments, as I understand it, that were raised about stewardship and you know long-term conservation um, of the site, and also comments that pertain to um, <coughs> avoidance. I think um, so. In, in relation to stewardship, um, stewardship has to be applied for. There has to be further work done in order to achieve a stewardship um, site, and. The, the final configuration of that stewardship site, would, it would be correct to say that, that that has to be resolved. But as part of a concept plan, the concept plan in my view illustrates that there's a high proportion of the site, and in fact the majority of the biodiversity of the site that can be subject to consideration for inclusion in a stewardship site. There are areas that were highlighted in the council response that talk about plantations of, of timber that may or may not be suitable for stewardship but in such circumstances there's also the possibility that you can have um, a conservation management plan that can be developed as an adjunct to um, a stewardship area and that can complement it and it can also be funded by the, the community under um, some sort of community funding arrangements but um, as I said in the in my my initial um, comments about the, the concept plan, um, there's about a thousand hectares of forest um, on the site. There's about 106 hectares that are, are indicated to be cleared. Those footprints will have to be refined as you go through individual detailed design and uh, preparation of individual VDARs. So there's potential for further avoidance considerations as part of those. Um, but I would also make the point that the majority of the biodiversity on the site has been avoided, including all of the mapped rainforest on the site and large blocks of um, relatively contiguous vegetation, particularly up in the sort of northwestern section. So I, I believe that the concept plan illustrates already that there's a, a, a reasonable degree of, of avoidance. 
Um, the other thing I've noted, um, my company has prepared quite a large number of BDARs and we've received comments about many of the BDARs and a common comment that comes in about any development that clears any vegetation that is um, being assessed as part of a BDAR process is that there's been insufficient um, avoidance and there's often a, a view that any any clearance of flora and fauna habitat represents insufficient avoidance. When you actually look at the legislation and the guidelines for the preparation of BDARs, it talks about a reasonable level of avoidance that has to be considered up front. And I, I believe that the concept plan has considered a reasonable level of avoidance in so far as the you know, a very high proportion of the, you know, the biodiversity of the site would be conserved, that there'd be an outcome in the order of 950 hectares that's proposed to be conserved um, from the 1500 hectare site. Anything further, Dr. Robinson, is that, that is, is that all you want to say? That's all I want to say at this stage, um, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Okay, no, that's that, that's that's fine. Thank you. Just didn't want to cut you off, Mr. Goff. Is that it in terms that, of that, that is our that is our response to the objections. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Goff, and thank everybody else. So, just before we adjourn, I'll just ask the panel members: Do you have any final questions of any of the, the either the council or the applicant? before we adjourn. No, no, okay, that's universal. All right, everybody, uh, thanks again for all of those submissions. There have been a lot of them. It's, you've given us a, a lot to think about. They've been very helpful. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your perseverance. Um, Mr. McGavin, you did a sterling job of, uh, of continuing to speak while the phone was ringing. Um, so thank you for that. I know that this is difficult, but uh, the communication has been effective and um, and uh, that has been very helpful for the panel. So we will adjourn to consider all that uh, we have before us. Um, we'll need, I would say, at least an hour, um, which would make it 6.30. In any case, if you want to rejoin at 6.30, um, we will advise you if we don't come back then, we'll advise you of our progress. Um, in the interim, Mr. McGavin, can you, are you accessible if we've got any questions? And similarly, Mr. Goff, are you accessible if we've got any questions during our adjournment? Yes, Chair. Yes. Yeah, we can, right up. Okay, we may, need to, we may need to talk to you about any points, but we will come to you if we do. Otherwise, we'll get back to you at 6.30. So with that, um, I'll adjourn the public meeting um, and once again, thank you. Thank you. Oscar. Hi everyone, it's Lisa Foley from the Planning Panel Secretariat again. Um, I've just dug in to let you know that the panel is still talking it out and I don't know, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to turn my camera on, but I don't think I can. Sorry about that. Uh, the chair's asked me to just step in and put it back 15 minutes. So the panel should be back at quarter to seven. And if not, I'll be back again to let you know what the new time frame is. Uh, I am very sorry for the inconvenience, but as I said, there will be, uh, they are just still talking it out. Does anyone have any questions for me? to do that. Lisa, is everybody on the line that needs to be the applicant and the council? Uh, uh, let's have a check. Uh, Lindsay McGavin, are you present? Yes, present. Thanks, Lindsay. And I see we've got Mr. Goff. You do, thank we've you. We've got Mr. Goff, thank you, okay. All right, uh, thank you for bearing with us and I'm sorry for the longer delay. The panel's made its determination or its decision and it is a unanimous decision and the decision is as follows. The panel is not satisfied that the proposed use is permissible because it does not satisfy the provisions of Schedule 5 of the Rural Land Sharing SEP and therefore refuses the application. 
that's the decision of the panel. As I say, it was a unanimous one, and we thank you all for your participation. And with that, I close the meeting. Thank you all. You too. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. What? what but I rang up and I said they closed the meeting. Hi. Sorry, did you miss the decision? Yes. The panel determined that the development application, I might be not getting this technically right, but the panel determined that it is not a permissible development and they therefore refused it. Um, and the proper decision will be up online within seven days. Does anyone else have any questions or concerns? Well, I um, if you can hear me, I didn't know, I didn't hear the decision because I've just got people exiting the meeting. Hi, sure. Um, so this may not be the correct wording. The correct wording will be up in seven days. Uh, but my understanding is the panel has just refused the application because they were not satisfied that it's permissible. Okay, refuse the application. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Terrific. Is Thanks. anyone else? Bye. Okay. Again.